I'm Dick Milberg, and welcome to our interview series. A lot of interesting people pass through our doors who are doing amazing work in brain monitoring. We bring them into our studio, put a mic on them, and get the personal stories you don't normally hear. We hope you enjoy them. Hi, I'm Dick Moberg, and welcome to our podcast. Today we have a very special guest, Jamie Mo Crazy, and she's spending the day with us at, at our company. And thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me be here. And we've we've had a wonderful talk by Jamie, uh, and her story is truly inspirational. And at the end of this, we'll tell you how you can look at that story as well, or how you can learn more about her and her foundation. So just a quick summary, Jamie was a professional skier um, at a very young age and started winning all of these championships. The first woman to do a double backflip on a ski, and she taught us how to do that this morning, right? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> and, um, you know, and she was really had a, uh, she had, uh, I think, an Olympic hopeful career right in front of her. And then, um, as happens uh, to a couple of people, um, she caught an edge, flipped, flipped down on the snow, and got a bad a traumatic brain injury uh, to the point when they were helicoptering her off the mountain. Uh, they actually, for filling out the fatality report, thinking she was going to die. So is that serious? But she, she ended up with some really good care. And what we want to talk about today is that process of care, of, of you know, going from the injury, what we know about the brain, to the care and then the the recovery phase, which is is quite long, that you can that you can tell us about. So, you know, I think why don't we why don't we just start with you giving a little um, recap of, you know, the, what you were doing, the amazing things you were doing, and then uh, the injury, hospital care, and then and the recovery, and then we'll go paint a big picture of. Uh, what are the problems with this, you know, with TBI from all these phases and, and how we all need to get together uh, to help, you know, make this better? So I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me here. I'm, I'm really excited about what you guys are doing. Um, and as you mentioned, there are so many stages. And I think that's something that's very, very key. There is your acute stages, your like the science that goes into what you are deliver like receiving in your acute stages, and then there's the rehabilitation stages, and then there's the recovery stages. And there's so many different aspects, and we definitely need to work more in collaboration through the different aspects because we all want the end result to be somebody who is alive and someone who is not just living but alive to thrive. No, exactly. So let's start from the beginning. Let's um, give us a couple of minutes about how cool you were on skis, because <laughs> I've seen some movies and it blows my mind <laughs> seeing you float in the air, you know, with these helicopters behind you. you know? <laughs> That's just so amazing to somebody who's a, an avid snowboarder. I mean, you're like uh, you're like what I dream to be, but. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, when I was born, I was born into a family um, that actually comes from skiing. My grandmother was actually a World Cup downhill champion, and my great uncle went to the Olympics twice in skiing. So I was born with that history. I was put on skis when I was a year old. I loved it. Like So as far back as my memory goes, there, the skiing was always a part of it. And as far back as my memory goes, I have always been kind of competitive and being the best in skiing was always part of my expectations. And I was also raised with a mom who had actually a federal grant for teaching self-esteem to women. So she raised me with the belief that no matter what ceilings were put on me, I could accomplish whatever I wanted if I performed at my own personal best and created the habits to accomplish what needed to be done. So that's how I was raised and it allowed me to win a lot in gymnastics and skiing and just most things that I competed in, I was one of the best. Um, and Something else that's kind of interesting is when I was 10 years old, actually, um, I was interviewed because I won state championships in skiing and I won state championships in gymnastics. And that winter when Christmas came around, I felt I had absolutely everything I wanted. 
So I told Santa that I didn't want any presents from Santa. I wanted Santa to sponsor a girl's education in a third world country to give her opportunities to create a life she loved because I felt so fortunate with my opportunities. Um, And then that concept when Christmas came around and my stocking was completely empty (laughs) I was a little bit like what was I thinking (laughs) um but I chose to do that at like 10 years old and then when I got into pro skiing I kind of forgot about that part of my life but after um my very critical brain injury which we'll get to that part became really strong giving people opportunities um and that's what our foundation does uh, that's great. It's a that's a it's a wonderful gift that that you were given by your genes and your family. I think. I mean, I can't think. You know, it's like they they planted the seed in a pot with good dirt and water to daily. You know, and, uh, so uh, no, that's great. And so let's let's hear a little bit about um, you know where you were in your career right before your accident, kind of at the peak of that, and and then the accident. N- not that you remember a lot of that, but what people tell you. Yeah. So I was uh, traveling around the world. Um, I was on the World Cup tour, going to X Games, going to Do Tour, um, traveling around. And something that I I thought was amazing was I was um, in my young 20s and we were traveling around Europe. And I would always try to go to some of the most important destinations or like the landmarks of each country because the little the ski the ski resorts are quite often in little like ski towns which are amazing places to go but then when I was like in France I would take the train to go to Paris and go see the Eiffel Tower Um, because you know a train trip is not very much to get to have a world-class experience. So everywhere I went, I was really into like learning about it beyond just the ski focus of it. Um, And I also started traveling with my little sister. So she actually was a professional skier as well. She currently is still competing professionally. Um, And when I was 18, I was actually living on my own out in Utah from Connecticut and New Hampshire. And she came out to visit me a couple times, and she made Youth Olympics that year. And I was like, oh, great, she'll just come live with me. And for some reason, my mom didn't feel comfortable with her 14-year-old living with her 18-year-old. I don't know why, but so she, so she decided to just move out as well, and we've all lived out there um, ever since. But so my sister and I, the, the couple years right before my accident, were traveling around everywhere, and... I was always my little sister's older sister, very talkative, very like knew everybody, powerful. Um, And then my little sister actually was at World Tour Finals, her first time that she made it to compete in World Tour Finals. And she was watching me in the slope style run. Slope style is multiple jumps and rails and you get judged on your overall impression. And she was competing in half pipe the next day. But she she gave me a hug as I dropped into my run, and she saw me take off the jump. She couldn't see the landing, and then she didn't see me hit the next jump. And um, that happens a lot in freestyle. You just fall, slide out or something. But then she heard the ski patrol radio crackle to life, saying we need all hands on deck and a helicopter on standby. And without a word, she put on her skis and skied down to me and saw me convulsing on the snow, spewing blood, and my eyes were rolled back in my head. That's a memory that she will have for life. And then what we hear is they uh, they came, they put you on a the toboggan, helicopter was there, and um, that they, they thought you were not going to make it, right? Yes, they actually... Um, immediately put put me well they did put me on the toboggan but they whistler is a very big mountain so i was heli lifted from an area of the mountain to the base of whistler and then i was heli lifted again from the clinic in whistler to vancouver general hospital and when i was in the toboggan at the very beginning um there was a ski patrol who was on top of me controlling my breath because i was not breathing on my own 
And that, and that happens when you get a brainstem injury, which I hear you had. It, that controls your breathing and heart function, all that. And they put an airway in, so they kept you alive, but they just were worried about your brain. I mean, the first thing they do is make sure you can breathe and your heart's pumping. Uh, and, and they didn't really get to work on your brain until you got to Vancouver General, right? And then you met Miracle Mip. Yes, I did. I, I don't remember this time meeting Miracle Mip, um, but I, I'm lucky to have been able to see him enough other times. Um, I've seen him repetitively about every year, and then he actually went up to my wedding in uh, May of 2022, and that was one of my lifelong um, most impactful memories was that he took the effort. He came to my wedding. Um, so... Yeah, but I, I met him in the hospital, and I don't remember this, but yeah, he met me. <laughs> and, you know, just to fill this in, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that uh, when I heard you talk uh, last week in San Francisco, you know, Jamie was the, one of the keynote speakers at the National Neurotrauma Society meeting, and she's mentioning this doctor, and I go, wait a minute, I know him. And so MIP... Uh, is a, uh, it's a guy who, he, he's young in his career, he studied over in Cambridge, England, uh, in, in what I call the mecca of multimodal monitoring. So these people are kind of the world leaders in, in what's called multimodal brain monitoring. And he studied there and then came back to Vancouver and uh, really understood you know, the, that you need to look at the brain from kind of multiple angles. You need to monitor lots of different things, just like they do the heart. You know, they don't make diagnoses on just an ECG. They look at, at, at uh, you know, the heart rate, the ECG waveform. They look at stroke volumes. They look at all this stuff to determine whether you have heart problems. Why don't they do that to the brain? And so that's kind of this, this new mantra. And he was one of the first people to really adopt that. And you were very fortunate to land in his hands. And you were one of the first people, I understand, that he, that he ran into the room with a drill and drilled a hole in your head, right? So he could put all these uh, brain monitors in there and probably helped you, uh, helped them manage you quite a bit. Yes, I, I am so thankful I was a part of that because according to MIP, I was the first person that they used it on. Um, and it is something I had no control over and was incredibly fortunate to experience. Somebody was looking out after you <laughs> so, somewhere along the line. So, yeah, it's amazing. And then, um, and then so you got through your hospital recovery, in, in my opinion, really nicely. I mean, it was you were in a coma for, what, about a week, I think? Ten days. Ten days, and then came out of it. And, you know, I've heard that from people. I've heard people in being in comas a lot longer than that. Um, and, then, and then I think your hospital care was – was pretty good, I mean, with MIP there. Um, and then what? So then you were in the hospital for 10 days and then? And then I, I um, well, I was in a coma for 10 days. I was in a hospital for two months. When I left, I, I still had a lot of amnesia. So I had complete amnesia for about uh, a month and a half. So no memory of those times. So even though I woke up from the coma, I uh, didn't know who anyone was. I, ha I had pictures all around my hospital room of my best friends and experiences, and my family would actually tell me these stories about these people. And um, I actually said to my mom, wow, Jamie has such awesome friends. And she was like, honey, you are Jamie. And I was like, really? Oh, yeah, I am, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> So I, I didn't even really know who I was. I, I didn't have any of my prior memories. They did start coming back, but something that we, we did a lot was um, playing the music that I liked to listen to prior to my brain injury and telling me stories about my life. And the more you would tell me stories, I, I would say, the movies are playing, the movies are playing in my brain, the movies are And that was my memories coming back. So there was a period of time when I had no memory of either long-term or short-term. And then my long-term memory started to come back, but I still didn't have short-term. And then they both decided to stick around for a bit. Well, that's good. So so now you're in Vancouver General, and then you were there for two months, is that right? Or did you go to? No, I actually was uh, airlifted on a medical Learjet and, um, to Salt Lake City. To Salt Lake City. Okay. 
to Intermountain Medical Center. And they're great. They're a great. Uh, yeah, my my too. older sister is actually a doctor, and um, my, my she was asking her colleagues where should we go. We were gonna go wherever it was supposed to go. We we were gonna move back to the U.S. because of insurance reasons, mm -hmm. um, but we were gonna go anywhere in in the U.S. And they said Intermountain is one of the best places. So just and then you will be at home and people can just drive from home just you know they see a lot and also um the university hospital there is really good too i mean we, yes we, we heard wonderful them. things about uh, them as well so they're both, so again i mean they they see a lot of probably tbi from park city and you know and all that so uh so they have a lot of experience so that's good so now this next phase of your life was uh was the uh, the rehab and recovery and as we'll talk about in a minute, that's one that's um, often neglected, and um, you were able to uh, to do that and take advantage of family and support. Uh, and tell us how that went. Uh, tell us where you started, and then clearly you did well <laughs> because you're sitting here talking to me. Um, so how did that go in the in the early phase, and where did you start? I mean, what was um, in terms of memory, uh, your motor functions, and all that. So where'd you start, and then um, where'd you end up? So, so w one of the first things was when I left the hospital, um, and they were establishing my outpatient plan, I was able to go to my um, speech, um, occupational, and speech therapy five days a week for three hours a day. And during that time, also, my mom had a master's in psychology and had studied early childhood brain development and done research on neuroplasticity. So I was doing therapy with her the rest of the time, and then I would be sleeping. Um, but that doesn't happen for very many individuals because most private insurances have a cap at roughly 30 visits. Um, so they'll say like go once a week for a period of time and that's not enough rehabilitation but there's nobody to be able to pay for the finances and support most of these individuals to have the upfront care that they need. It's not the acute <coughs> stages care but it's still upfront enough that, that you have a better recovery if you receive all these you know, five days a week instead of once every month um, on rehabilitation, you're able to like um, mix the ha like work on habits daily and stuff. Um, so that's one of the first things that I was um, able to receive because Utah is a grant recipient. You, you know, it would be like uh, you wanting to be a pro skier and only able to practice one day a week. Yeah. You're not going to get there, right? It's kind of ridiculous. To the think rehab's that. the same thing. You're trying to practice yeah. to get back to normal, and you just can't do it one day a week. I mean, that's kind of silly, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and um, brain injury is, is so expensive. It's um, one of our largest acquired disabilities, and um, the finances tied to it, $76.5 billion in the U.S. Um, a lot of those um, disabilities would have a different story told around them mm -hmm. if they were given the upfront treatment. And then it continues, but the upfront is important and then the next stages as well. Yeah, and so I, th I think, let, let's talk about in, in the remaining minutes about your, you know, the, your mission and, and what we're doing and why I'm so happy you came to visit us. And, you know, I like to, I like to think of, um, you know, you know, brain injury has multiple, uh, multiple facets uh, that we have to address to really make progress in it. And, and to me, there's kind of three areas. The, the first is, what do we know about the brain? And then what do we know about the injured brain? And, and the answer is, we, we know very little. I mean, we're just right at the beginning of, of understanding the brain. We, we've made a lot, of, a lot of progress with imaging and all this stuff, but just not... Um, Kind of, kind of right at the beginning. And then you have managing a patient in the hospital. That's kind of the second phase, is, um, is managing them really carefully. And, and then the third phase is once you get out of the hospital, the whole rehab thing. And I think with all of these, you know, in, in the hospital phase, which is what our company works on, you have all this data that's in silos. And what we're trying to do is put it all together. 
And so you see the complete picture of the brain and then try to apply AI and other technologies to really try to figure out and manage uh, the, the patient the best you can. Um, and then rehab, as, as, as we both know, is something that um, it, it's, it's very, um, I'd say, underfunded. Uh, and it's, 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 as some people, it's almost not funded. It kind of depends on the insurance you have. And to me, it's kind of the most important part. I mean, getting through the hospital phase, sets, it sets your beginning in rehab. And then you either go up or down, depending on the rehab. And the better you go through your hospital stay, the higher you are entering rehab, and then the easier it is to, you know, to get get better. But boy, if you don't have funding or you don't have insurance, um, you have all these people out there that are um, that need round the clock care, and uh, or they get depressed and suicide. I mean, it's kind of a mess. So, so I think to to really uh, make progress, you need funding, and we need. Um, people uh, working in this field, and we need advocates like, like you uh, to uh, raise the awareness and everyone from Congress to, you know, other, uh, to, to other people in the field uh, about how we need to solve the, the, the complete problem. Yeah, yeah. And, and about raising awareness um, and the, the rehabilitation is when you're, you're on that journey, every brain injury survivor can create a life they love. I'll be honest with you, many of them will not have a society um, perceived successful recovery. However, with the way our world works and our modern technology, you can have reminders on your phone. You can get nudged for all these things. You can work two hours remotely. You don't need to go drive a car to a nine to five job. There's so much variety to be able to find a way to contribute back to society and find a way for you to feel like there's a reason why you, you lived. Because one of the things that we our foundation has found a lot of is that people think after they have a brain injury, it's guaranteed that they will have lifelong disability and it's guaranteed that their life will be worse. So many people that we've been in contact to have had stereotypically successful recoveries like mine and they don't stay connected to the brain injury world because there's such a stigma tied to it. So if you are a very successful business owner or a very successful senior policy member, you're not going to want the rest of the people you work with to know that you were in a coma 30 years ago because they will all be assuming that you will be underperforming because of the brain injury. Um, but we know now with the recoveries, you can change your synaptic connections and rebuild your brain to be able to deliver at a very, very high level. So that's something that we would like to promote is that people who've had a successful recovery stay connected to brain injury and also want to make it clear that everybody will have a change in their life people are like let me I want to just get back to who I was before that's not going to happen even if you have a lot of similarities to who you were before you're going to have this life-changing trauma mixed into it and it's going to make you think differently and for some people it can be a huge benefit it can help your new identity of who you are um, but to feel like even if you do have these visible disabilities, you can still take action to create a life you love. Um, and that's why we are so involved in creating awareness and opportunities through um, programs, policy, education, all sorts of ways of creating opportunities for the brain injury survivors and the family caregivers throughout the whole picture. So everybody works together to create a smooth flow towards recovery. I'm really thankful for people like you who can, can do that, who can keep people uh, um, motivated, give them hope, you know, to in their recovery phase. And this is a great uh, segue into your new nonprofit. Do you want to tell us about that? And um, we'll, put a, we'll put a little note in the uh, bottom of the video about that. So tell us about your nonprofit. Well, thank you very much. Um, my nonprofit is Mo Crazy Strong Brain Injury Foundation. Um, and some of the ideas and the peer-to-peer -peer guidance and things like that actually started like less than a year after my brain injury. When I was still heavily recovering for myself, people started asking questions because of my mom's education, her prior education to my brain injury. 
Um, and then um, she actually went back to get her PhD in mind-body medicine so we could have the science behind why the actions that she took for my recovery not only benefited me but can be repeatable to the benefit of anyone who does them. And then in September of 2022, we actually received our official 501c3. Um, and then recently we have um, produced our short documentary, Hashtag Mo Crazy Strong, um, which when you're listening to this podcast might have gone public yet. I don't know. It's in the process. Um, but 2023 and 2024, we did a film festival run. Um, and it really helped raise awareness and communication about certain aspects like patient-centered versus person-centered, um, family involvement, um, different aspects to the recovery process. And we actually have Dr. Miracle Mip interviewed in it, which I'm so grateful that he was willing to do that because I think it adds a whole nother dimension to this uh, family story when you have um, a very, very competent um, neuro doctor involved. Right. right. Well, we, we wish you luck in your foundation and um, we hope to see you back here at our company at some point in the future. And I'm looking forward to working with you and you know, all, all doing our part to advance uh, TBI. And, uh, Thank you. And um, info at mocrazystrong.org if you'd like to reach out. We're always looking to make connections because like your company, Dick, um, every aspect of brain injury from the initial research to the end result is so important to the whole picture. So, I'm 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 super excited that I'm here and happy to keep working together. We are too. Thanks, and we'll see you back in Philly soon. I hope. So thanks for joining us. Thank you.